Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us today online and in person. We are one church in many locations, and I'm so happy to see more and more of you each week in person, seeing your face. And let's just admit it, you've all got beautiful faces. If you go to Avalon Church, you're not ugly. That's what I'm going to say. Now, you might look around and say, well, there's a couple iffy people in here. But the, the fact is, they're not ugly, all right? If you come to Avalon Church, you're beautiful, and I'm so glad to see your beautiful face. And I cannot wait to see more and more of you each week um, as you're joining us live and in person. And thank you so much for being a part of our service today. Well, we're in this series about questions. God has asked some important questions of us. And so we're continuing today, and we're going to talk about the one thing that Christianity hinges on, the one thing that you and I must deal with if we're going to become a follower of Christ. And it's not just necessary to become a follower of Christ, but it's necessary for you to grow spiritually. It's the one thing, the one thing. Um, it is necessary for you to have victory and peace in your life. If you want to live a victorious Christian life, and who doesn't? Everybody wants to, to win. Everyone wants to live that kind of life, right? It's the one thing. Now, the fact is, it's also the one thing that we're afraid of. And often when we think about it, we misunderstand it. And it's the one thing that I want you to see today and I really believe that it applies to everyone. In fact, this passage of Scripture that I'm going to read today is a very famous passage of Scripture. But I, I believe also it is very misunderstood. Now, there are some applications made from this passage that I've made before that I think are good. They're okay. But it's not the primary thing that Jesus was saying. You know, if you take the words that Jesus said, and you try to soften them a little bit, they lose their meaning, they lose their impact. And so today we want to talk about this one thing. Now let me just kind of set the scene for you so you can understand what we're going to read. Jesus and his disciples were, they, he was talking to them, he wasn't talking to the crowd. Everywhere Jesus went, crowds showed up. Because he healed people, he raised people from the dead, he made blind people be able to see. I mean, he, was, uh, he spoke with the authority because he was the son of God. And so it's pretty incredible. Everywhere he went, all these crowds showed up. And, but Jesus is here, and it's kind of like a staff meeting, all right? It, it's kind of like, a, um, it's like a, a personal thing to his disciples. He's not talking to all the crowd. He's not... He's not really letting them on. It's kind of like he's building these guys up. He's talking to them, and he's trying to teach them something. In fact, he's trying to teach them this most important thing. And yet, Simon Peter, he's one of the disciples, Simon Peter rebukes Jesus. Now, that's incredible, right? I mean, you don't normally rebuke the Son of God. But that's what Simon Peter did because he misunderstood. And then Jesus went off. Now, I don't mean that he lost it. He did this on purpose. He had righteous indignation. He got so upset, so angry, because Peter and the disciples missed the point. Here's how upset he got. He turned to Peter, and he said, get behind me, Satan. Now, has anybody ever had somebody say that to you before? Anybody? I have. Um, actually, it's not very pleasant, but uh, before I moved to Georgia, before Kim and I <coughs> moved to Georgia uh, 25 years ago, uh, we worked at a church in Florida. And I did a lot of baptizing. We saw a lot of people saved and baptized at this church. And I was one of the main ones that did the baptizing. And one day, I baptized a woman, lovely woman, but she was blind. Now, can you imagine how difficult it would be, how fearful it would be for a person that's blind to get into a baptismal pool and to allow themselves to be put under water. Now that, that would be terrifying. Some people are afraid of it anyway, but particularly if you're blind, you'd be very afraid of that, right? I know I would. And so she was in front of all these people and I was getting ready to baptize her and I said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, bear with him in baptism. And I went to put her under and she panicked. She panicked. She started grabbing my shirt. She started flailing around. 
And I was like, you know what, lady, you, you got the nerve and courage to get up here in front of all these people. We're just going to keep on going. And I just put her under, and I brought her back up. And when I did, this woman was flat, uh, flailing around, splashing around, and she turned to me and said, Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I'm like, lady, I'm not really the person you should be saying that to, but nevertheless, I understand. Now, Jesus says this, and he's not kidding. He says it to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. And the reason he said this is because, as we'll see, that Peter and the disciples really did not understand the purpose of God. And they didn't understand what Jesus came to do. And they didn't understand really what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 8. And we're going to read down through chapter 9 verse 1. Uh, because it's all I've told you this before that when it was originally written, it didn't have chapters and verses. Those were added later so we could find our place. And so this is the one conversation. It flows in one conversation. Here's what Jesus says. And it says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man... Now, that's a name for Jesus. That's an Old Testament name for Jesus. So he's referring to himself. He said, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. In other words, he wasn't speaking in parables. He wasn't telling stories. He wasn't using metaphor. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to be vague. He said, plainly, I'm going to die, and I'm going to resurrect from the grave. Now, they didn't, they didn't get it. They didn't understand. They thought maybe he was just trying to use a teaching tool, maybe to teach them something. They didn't get it. And notice what Peter did. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples. Now, notice, he's talking to the 12. They're kind of... In a group, small group, all right? And people on the outside, the crowds, they're trying to listen in. They're trying to pick up. Jesus is not talking to them, all right? And so Peter takes him from the 12, and he begins to rebuke him. Jesus, you can't say this. Jesus, you're not going to do this. We need you. And notice what he did. He turned back to the disciples. He turned back to them, looking at them. And he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Can I just pause and say this? That is what makes us guilty. In truth, we are born, we, we sinned in Adam. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for all of sin. So we are born spiritually dead we're born in need of God now children I believe go to heaven uh, children are uh, in in that close relationship with God but when we become when we become accountable we are uh, separated from God we're born that way you don't become a sinner because you sin you sin because you are born a sinner does that make sense okay so in Adam we sin but I want you to see what what separates the person that's able to live for Christ and able to uh, live victoriously and the person that's able to become a follower of Christ is this. You start understanding and thinking about the things of God rather than the things of man. Now the Apostle Paul wrote this. He said that uh, people that are not in the Spirit, in other words, when the Spirit of God is not working in them and teaching them and, and speaking to them, it says that they can't understand the things of God because they're foolishness unto them. They seem like foolishness because they are spiritually discerned. And all that means is they're not capable in their own way of thinking of understanding the plan of God, the mind of God. So he says what you're guilty of is thinking man's way, not God's way. Okay? Now, are we not guilty of this all the time? I, I mean, I think about my own selfish, selfishness, my own agenda, right? We think Richie's way, 
not God's way. And I'm not saying all oh, you think Richie's way because I know you don't, all right? So, but you think your way, right? And I think my way. And, and I'm like, God, what do you mean? This is, uh, this is not supposed to happen. And God says, no, I have something better for you. I have something bigger for you. I have something uh, that's going to change you and change the world around you. And we're like, no, I don't want that. Uh, we are guilty so many times of thinking our way rather than God's way. And, and that's especially true when it, becomes, uh, when it comes to being a follower of Jesus Christ. The way of humanity's thinking is this. I'm a pretty good person. I promise you, if you go out into your neighborhood, if you go out across the street to the mall, if you go to Starbucks, if you go to any public place, you go to your school, and you ask people, do you think you're a good person? 99 out of 100 are going to say, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. And that's man's way of thinking. Now, comparatively speaking, okay, in their mind, what they're saying is, you know what, I'm not a murderer. And so compared to that guy, yeah, you're good. You're a moral person. But Jesus did not come for morality. Jesus did not come to get you to turn over a new leaf. Jesus did not come for half measures. He came to set you free. He came to bring dead things back to life. And it's through the power of the gospel. Well, let's read on. He says, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples. Now, wait a minute. He just did something different here. He was just talking to the disciples, kind of a private conversation, kind of a pick-me-up, kind of an explanation, a staff meeting. Now he turns and invites everybody. Now that's significant. You know why? Because he was getting ready to say something that applies to you and me. If we were in that crowd, he would ask us to come over. All right, so notice what he does. And he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And here's the question, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? The, the Greek word there, and those of you that go to church, you know that the New Testament was written in Greek originally, Koine Greek, and the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic. And so when we read it in English, it has been translated from those original languages, all right? So the word that is translated soul, it is an interchangeable word that normally means your life. So let's read it that way. He said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? In other words, what Jesus is saying, uh, hey, look. What good would it be for somebody to say, hey, we're going to make you the world's first trillionaire. But the only cost to you is it's going to cost your life. You're not going to enjoy it because it's going to, you, in order to get it, you've got to die. Well, I mean, nobody's going to take that deal. That's a horrible deal. I mean, you wouldn't get any benefit out of that whatsoever. And so he says, what would it profit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit his life or his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his life, his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And I used to read that and think, boy, if I'm ever embarrassed of being a Christian or embarrassed about things of God or somebody embarrasses me, man, it means I'm not going to go to heaven. That's not what that means at all. Being ashamed is not accepting Christ as your Savior. That's really what he's talking about. For anybody that's ashamed, then uh, he says, I'll be ashamed of you. And then he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now, he was saying that there were some people there that were going to be persecuted. And that's true. All of his disciples, except for John, were martyrs later. And they tried to kill John a couple times. It didn't take. And so uh, he was saying, some of you are going to be persecuted. Some of you are not going to taste of death. And do you see the power of God? And he was talking about something very specific. He was talking about the power of the gospel. This life-changing thing that would enter into the world and change the world. That's what he's talking about. Now, 
let, let me just kind of bring this home a little bit. The fact is, there are many people, and I include myself in this, that have preached this passage and missed the point. Not completely, because if you read this passage and what you get from it, and it's easy to do this, and I've said this, if you get the point that you got to be willing to sacrifice in order to follow Christ. Anybody ever heard that or thought that or read that? Okay. Uh, I've thought that. Um, if you're going to um, be a follower of Christ, you got to be willing to set your agenda aside. You got to be willing to give up some things. You got to be willing to take up your cross. And, and, and by that, we mean we got to be willing to suffer. We got to be willing to sacrifice. We got to be willing to give to others. Now, and I'm not saying those are bad applications. You, you can get an application from that, but that is not what Jesus was saying. Not even remotely. And in fact, when you get what Jesus truly was saying, it's shocking. It's radical. But it's necessary for you and me. It's necessary for the gospel. You see, what Jesus did here, he said, if you're going to come after me. Now, understand that to understand the Bible, you've got to understand what's the context, okay? And you've got to think, like, what was he saying to those people and how did they accept it? Now, remember, the audience that he had had no idea that he was going to die on the cross and resurrect from the grave. Not even his disciples, even though he plainly told them this. They didn't get it. So when Jesus started talking about taking up your cross, they were like, whoa, what in the world is this guy talking about? Because taking up a cross was not about self-sacrifice. Taking up a cross was not about self-denial. Taking up a cross was a brutal instrument of death. So think of it this way. If we were contemporaries of that crowd and, and like... If Jesus were saying it to us today, um, or we were doing, we were saying what Jesus actually was saying the way that people would understood it then, we'd say something like this: If you want to be a member of Avalon Church, you got to go to the electric chair. <laughs> like, what? What kind of weirdo is that? What kind of weird teaching is that? You would not need a very big building to hold the crowd if that's what you said. In order to join our church, you got to go to the electric chair. Because you'd be like, that is stupid. I don't get that. But that is exactly what Jesus was saying. Not the electric chair part, but the cross. Because what they understood the cross to be was a brutal instrument of death. It was, it was not this uh, little thing that we put on a charm around a necklace or a bracelet today. It was a brutal instrument of death. Now, now, once again, get the picture. He was talking to his disciples. He told them he was going to die. And he was going to resurrect. Peter rebuked him. <clears throat> he said, get behind me, Satan. Then he calls everybody in. Now, he had just been talking about he's going to die. Now, read it and understand it this way. Because what he was saying to all of these people was this. If you're going to follow me, you're going to die. That's what he's saying. If you're going to follow me, it requires death. Now, wait a minute. That's, that's crazy. What could that actually mean? You see, Jesus wants us to understand that the gospel is not about half commitment. It's not about little bit of Christianity. It's not about small efforts or morality or turning over a new leaf. The gospel is about death. You say, wait a minute, Richie, I thought the gospel was about life. Well, it is, but don't get it out of order. So I want you to see what Jesus is saying. He said, if you're going to come after me, if you're going to follow me, you've got to lose your life. You've got to take up your cross. You've got to forfeit your life. Now, when we understand that context... It makes us understand completely in a different way what Jesus was saying. He was not saying that 
you uh, need to turn over a new leaf or be willing to sacrifice. Those are good things, okay? But that was not what he was saying. And here's the one thing, this radical statement that Jesus made. And he did this a lot. He said, if you want to be the leader, you got to be the servant. He said, if you want to get, you got to give. He said, if you want to be first, you got to be last. He said, you got to love your enemies. Well, this was maybe one of the most radical things that Jesus had ever said. Take up your cross and follow me. And, and here's the one thing. We said there's this one thing, and here it is. Life begins with death on the cross. That's what it means. Jesus was not suggesting that in order to become a follower of Jesus, you need to turn over a new leaf. He said that if you're going to become a follower of Christ, death must be involved. Complete and radical and utter death. I mean, think about that. There's no such thing as being kind of dead, right? There's no such thing as being a little bit dead. I don't think you could be a little dead or a little pregnant, right? I mean, you either are or you are not, right? On either one of those, uh, you're either dead or you're alive. Now, I want to just give you this as we kind of close this out to understand what Jesus was truly saying. He said, before you live, you must die. I must learn to die to human ideology, to selfishness, and my human way of thinking and living. In fact, when he preached the famous Sermon on the Mount, and he talked about the Beatitudes, the first thing he said that was recorded for us that he said was, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That word poor, the poor in spirit, it wasn't like walking around going, oh, I'm so humble. That word poor meant utterly devastated, incapable of even lifting a hand to help yourself. You are so broken, so poor, that unless someone else waits on you or helps you, you're going to die. And that's what we've got to do to come to God. We have to admit, it's not my effort. It's not my works. It is by your grace and your grace alone. It is by your love and your love alone. It is not because I joined the church. It is not because I quit a bad habit. It's not because I helped a little old lady across the street. It's not because I'm a good neighbor. It is because of the death of the Son of God on the cross that brings us life. That's what he's saying, okay? Now I want you to understand this. My life begins with Christ's death on the cross. Humanly speaking, there's life, then death, right? You have a baby, the baby lives, hopefully a really long time. At the end of his or her life, they die. Life, then death. But in Christianity, it's the opposite. It's death, then life. You see, it's the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is the death of of our own spirit, our own, we are born dead, spiritually dead. And because of Jesus' death, our death, our dead spirit can be reborn, we can be born again, and we can begin to live in life forever because it begins with the death of Christ and then life. See the difference? You see, in, in, uh, in humanity, humanly speaking, it is life then death. But in Christianity, in redemption, in God's sovereign plan, it is death, then life. My life begins with Christ's death on the cross. My life, my hope begins not with good effort, not with being willing to sacrifice. My life can only begin because of the death of the Son of God, because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. You see... Um, in this, there's a choice involved. And what Jesus was saying was this. He said, if you're going to come after me, if you're going to follow me, you've got to understand there's a death involved. My death, they didn't really understand what he was saying. We've got the ability to look back and understand. But he says, also your death. There's a choice. There's a purpose involved. There's a, there's a benefit involved. He said, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world but loses his own life? Well, he's making this stark contrast that he is going to ransom us and redeem us and deliver us. My life finds meaning with my death on the cross. 
Um, I'm going to read these two verses out of order, the two passages I have. I'm just talking to the tech booth. Um, the reason I'm going to do this is because the Apostle Paul wrote both of these passages that helps us understand. He actually was expounding upon what Jesus said on this, if you're going to you know, follow me, you've got to take up your cross. Um, the first, one of the first letters he wrote was the book of Galatians. He wrote it before the book of Romans, and you can tell that he's understanding this more and more, that the Spirit of God is revealing to this to him more and more. Look in Galatians 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. Remember what Jesus said? You want to follow me? You've got to take up your cross. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. And that's the key to understanding. If it's death, then life. What is the key? What is necessary? It's my faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? It is my faith in Him. He says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Does that not help us understand better what Jesus was saying? If you're going to follow me, take up your cross. Once again, He was not even remotely talking about being self-sacrificing or moral. He's saying there's a death involved. There is a radical death involved. Then he expounds on it even more later when he wrote the letter to the Roman church. Listen to what he said in Romans 6. He said, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. By the way, that old self, he's talking about your old nature. That's your sinful nature. That's what you still have after you become a follower of Jesus. That's why you still struggle with losing your temper. That's why you still struggle with temptation. That's why you still struggle with saying the unkind words that you shouldn't say. That's why you still so, uh, struggle with being selfish. That's why you still struggle with these thoughts and these sins, because that's the old self. But notice what he said. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. When you begin to understand this, it is eye-opening. It is radical. It is so life-giving. It makes us understand that victory is possible and peace is possible. You know why? Because of the death of Christ. And because I literally was crucified with him when I put my faith in the Son of God, he lives through me. I am no longer a slave to sin. That's what he's saying. Because the only way to follow Christ is through death. And it's the death of Christ on the cross. But God says for every one of us who by faith believe in him, that we were crucified with him. And our old nature was crucified on that cross with Jesus. And now we are no longer slaves to sin. Oh man, that, that's amazing. And he says, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Oh, I, I don't do that anymore. Why? Because I died. What? What? What are you talking about? No, no. When I received Christ, I died. Wait, you, you look, no. I, I'm dead. I'm dead to sin. I was crucified with Christ. And I'm living a new life now. I'm brand new now. That's what Paul was saying. He said, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And what he's saying is this reverse process. Peter, get behind me. You're not thinking like God. You're thinking like man. You think that it's life and then death. And I'm telling you, it's death. And then it's life forevermore. There will be no more death. When you receive him, he lives in you. And he has conquered death. And you will be alive forever and ever with God. Oh, what a wonderful understanding of what the gospel really does for us. I am crucified with Christ. Uh, I am no longer a slave to sin. Because... We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives to God so that you also must consider yourselves 
dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> wow. So what Jesus was saying, don't try to soften it. You missed the point. You missed the beauty. You missed the amazing grace of God. You're not suggesting that what you and I need to do is be a little more moral. Try a little harder. He's not suggesting that what you and I need to do is turn over a new leaf, be willing to sacrifice, be willing to give up something. That's not what take up your cross means. It means that when I take up that cross, I utterly, completely die along with Jesus Christ on the cross. Why? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that now I can live. Ladies and gentlemen, when you have given your life to Christ, when you have put your faith in Him, peace is possible. Deliverance is possible. Hope is possible. Prayer is possible. Living for God is possible. Why? Because you're dead, but you are now alive in Jesus Christ, and you are no longer a slave to sin, and you don't have to live that old way anymore because God has delivered you. But this most amazing and radical thing called the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, take up your cross and follow me. And oh, if you'll just understand that when I take up the cross, I'm saying I am dying. I am being crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's not me, but Christ is living through me. Therein lies hope. You see, you're not going to have hope if you keep on depending on yourself and you just keep on depending on turning over a new leaf self effort nothing wrong with discipline nothing wrong with trying I'm not suggesting there is what I'm saying is that hope comes through Jesus what's the one thing what's that one thing that you and I need to know what's that one thing life begins with death on the cross my life begins with Christ's death on the cross. Heavenly Father, help us to understand the radical nature of the love of God. It's so completely different than what we think so many times. Thank you for the beauty of it. Thank you, Jesus, that you, you got upset with Peter, not because he was a bad guy, but because he didn't understand. He didn't understand the things of God. What you were trying to do was not turn over a new leaf or not make people more moral, but you were eradicating sin and you were defeating death and you were crucifying us with you so that we could live forever with God. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder those of you joining us here in the room or those of you joining us online, would you like to enter into that death and then life with Jesus Christ? It's real simple. You just put your faith in Him, just like Paul wrote in Galatians 2. It's the faith that I have in the Son of God that changes me. Here's what you need to do. Pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, and I'm receiving you right now by faith. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. And Lord, I pray that through your death, you would deliver me and forgive me. You'll pray that prayer, click, raise your hand, click, and do that online or here in person. Fill out one of the next step cards and let us know that you pray to receive Jesus Christ today. Father, thank you for the amazing, radical love of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a couple things on next steps. Don't forget about the Zoom Next Step class um, that will happen next week. If you're interested in that, sign up. If you'd like to give in the offering today, I would encourage you, uh, here, those of you in person, there's a few ways you can give. You can give, obviously, online or at a giving kiosk or by texting 84321. Or you can drop it in the bucket on the way out the door. Okay? For those of you that have joined us online today, you can give by texting 84321, or you can give online at avalonchurch.net forward slash give. We thank you so much for your faithfulness to give, and thank you so much 
for your faithfulness to be a part of our church. Uh, whatever your next step is, if you want to join us with the Next Step class, if you want to sign up for the next baptism, if you want to be a part of a ministry here, we encourage you to do that. Take your next step. I want you to know that I love you. God bless you for being here today. It is so good to see you. So happy that you're able to join us in person. And then uh, those of you that are joining us at home, at your home, uh, at your uh wherever you are on the road, uh, at a coffee shop, wherever you're joining us, thank you so much. God bless you. I love you. And I can't wait to see you again next week. Have a great week. You're dismissed. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.